Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Liberty Law Talk is featured at the online journal Law and Liberty, which is available at lawliberty.org. Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm Richard Reinch. Today we're talking with Mike Gonzalez about his new book, BLM, The Making of a New Marxist Revolution. Mike Gonzalez is Senior Fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Allison Center for Foreign Policy. He's had 20 years of experience as a journalist. He's been a speechwriter in the Bush administration, and he writes widely on national identity, diversity, multiculturalism, nationalism, and related issues. Mike is also a regular contributor to Law and Liberty. It's the first time on Liberty Law Talk. We're glad to have you on the program, Mike. Uh, the pleasure is all mine, uh, Richard. Thank you very much for having me on. It's, uh, it's an honor. So, Mike, as, as you say in the book a couple of times, and, and I'll state it here, uh, the book is about Black Lives Matter and is sort of taking you inside the organization, who funds it, what it believes, what its objectives and purposes are, who composes it, who leads it. But in all of that, you are not, and certainly the purpose of this interview is not to dispute the idea that Black Lives Matter, the sentiment or the statement. We are talking about the organization and suite of organizations or allies who are a part of Black Lives Matter, the movement. And so with that said, what are the goals of Black Lives Matter or, or what is it built on? Yeah, let me let me actually first uh, make a, a comment on what you just said because I believe there are four things here that are that are really quite distinct. The first one is the concept Black Lives Matter. The concept is unimpeachable, and I I embrace the concept. And I actually never say all lives matter. I say Black Lives Matter. I'm very proud to say that, and that is because Black Americans have gone through uh, incredible hardships that none of us none of no other American has gone through. I don't need to, you know, slavery, Jim Crow, segregation, et cetera, and incredible discrimination. So Black Lives Matter is a great slogan. Then there's the movement, and I'm not sure what that means. I think that means people who turned out to the demonstrations and the marches and, and were peaceful about it, or who embraced the concept. Then there are the organizations. The organizations, uh, primarily, as you, as you very well put, it's a suite of organizations, but there are two main ones. If you Google Black Lives Matter, Google sends you to the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, BLMGNF. That is the premier, the flagship organization. That is itself a coalition. And then there's the Movement for Black Lives, which is yet another coalition, but very important. It was set up right after Ferguson. And then, fourth, they are the founders of these organizations. And the founders are all Marxists. They say they're Marxists. It's not me saying they're Marxists. And then we go into your question, what are their goals? Well, if you listen to the founders and if the journalists listen to the founders, they have been very candid. Alicia Garza, one of the three founders, uh, said very clearly to a group of main Marxists in 2019, so not that long ago, that what she wanted was the dismantling of the organizing principle of this society. Quote, unquote, that what she wanted was to, to, to change how we're organized as a society. So for those listening at home, uh, that means uh, not just things that are racist in America. They, it, it is everything. And it's your son's little league game. It's uh, your daughter's volleyball team. It is your book club. It's everything. It's American, it's American life. It's, it's, it's our way of life. And they, they are very clear that they're Marxist. Uh, Patrice Collers, a second, also a very important former executive director of BLM GNF, and also a founder of the of Black Lives Matter. She said that very clearly, and she states it all the time, that her and, and Alicia Garza are Marxist. And she actually uses it, the term trained Marxist. And there's a very recent, there's a very good reason why she says trained, that's because she was recruited by Eric Mann. Now that is his word. Eric Mann said he recruited Patrice Collers. Eric Mann, Eric Mann is a former member of the Weather on the Ground. That was a, a, a an FBI designated terrorist group in the 60s and 70s. Uh, they spent a lot of the members spent time in prison because they tried to to, to use terrorist tactics uh, to bring revolution to America. Eric Mann spent time in prison, and then he set up the the, the Labor Community Strategy Center in, in Los Angeles, which recruited uh, Patrice Cullors and trained her in Marxism. Alicia Garza, too, was trained in Marxist-Leninism. She has said this herself. So that is who they are. 
in what they want. They hate capitalism. They say that capitalism is racist and needs to be destroyed and smashed. And they uh, they, they like Marxism, Leninism, mm-hmm. and that it's, so it's the organizations and the founders, yeah. uh, not the concept to which I subscribe. Talk about the sort of ideological structure here. Uh, a term we hear a lot, critical race theory. We also hear the term anti-racism. Uh, talk in depth about critical race theory, what it is, uh, where it comes from. So critical race theory is is really the discipline, the, the academic discipline behind Black Lives Matter. It emerges in law schools in America in the late 70s and then really gathers strength in the 80s. It comes from critical legal theory or critical legal studies which posited that American uh, racism was, was American, that the, the system was of oppression, that the system, that the inequality was written into the law by people with money, by people, by the powerful who wanted to perpetuate their power and they wanted to, to keep it. And that's the, they wrote the Amer- American laws to do that. Now, uh, black professors and black uh, law students attending these conferences of critical legal theorists agreed with all that, but then they, they added, but all these people are white. And, and, and what this is, is just racism. And you're refusing to deal with that. So they had incredible arguments. And in 1989, they, they left, they, they split. They created their own organization they called Critical Race Theory, which is the first time that that term is used. It was at a, at a, at a convent outside Madison, Wisconsin. The organizer was Kimberly Crenshaw, a, a law professor. Did you say a convent? A convent. Okay. A, a convent. A convent, a, 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 a former convent outside of Madison, Wisconsin. In fact, uh, uh, years later, just a few years later, Richard Delgado, one of the godfathers of CRT, of critical race theory, gave an interview in which he said it was uh, that they were all there to these two dozen professors, uh, law professors, and looking at the crucifixes and looking at the stained glass windows. And he said it was an odd place for a bunch of Marxists. This is Richard Delgado. Uh, and indeed, it was an odd place for a bunch of Marxists. So what critical race theory believes is that racism is not individual, is not something people, uh, it's not an individual sin that people commit when they refuse to follow Christ's dictum, you know, to, to love thy neighbor, when they, they refuse to, to love their neighbor because of their race. Uh, according to critical race theory, it's not, a, not nothing to do with an individual, individual practice or individual beliefs or individual uh, sin. It's, it's, a, it's a systemic thing it, that all of American society is suffused with racism and has been so since the founding. And then they, these, these law professors kind of took over in the 90s, kind of became dominant in the civil rights domain within the law schools. They evicted their white colleagues because they the critical legal theorists. They evicted them, and they became dominant. Uh, but they, they had a very limited impact on, on public policy but on, for about 20 years. And then in the last 10 years or so, they begin to, to really grow in K through 12, they, they begin to, to get its grips on, the, on uh, education, primary education, secondary education. But then it really explodes with 2020 with Black Lives Matter, which is the subject of my book, BLM, The Making of a New Marxist Revolution. And then it enters all aspects of our lives. Right? This is why we're all talking about critical race theory, why I'm traveling the country from coast to coast. I've been to 15 cities in the last three months. I'll be up to, in another 12 cities in the next three months talking about critical race theory because Americans are up in arms about what is being taught to their children. Now, I should add parenthetically, maybe you want to ask me more about that, yeah. that critical legal theory itself is an outgrowth of critical theory, yeah. which yeah. came, which was born in Germany in the 20s and 30s and was, a, a again, a Marxist group of scholars who, who believed that, that they had to criticize and really kind of ridicule all institutions in society in order to to introduce the idea of, of revolution. Uh, so so that, that in, a, in a nutshell, the pedigree, the intellectual pedigree of these disciplines, critical race theory, critical legal theory, and critical theory. Critical theory comes to this country um, in the 1930s in the forms of uh, intellectuals practicing it. And when you say criticizing every aspect of society, I assume that's according to Marxism. Yeah, no, they... Uh, they, they, they and one of the things they want to do, I th- it seems, from what I've read, is they want to take things that Americans take for granted and sort of enjoy, like consumer behavior. Right, right. And ridicule that. Right. They, 
yeah, they want to denigrate all aspects of our lives. They, they, they sit there, they, they, they're very conflicted. And in the early 20s, they realized that what Marx and Engels had promised, which was revolutions everywhere, the, the working class, the proletariat, rising and overthrowing the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, it's just not happening. It failed in Germany, failed in Italy. It, it only succeeds in a backwater place called Russia, and it succeeds very temporarily in Hungary. So then they be, begin to ask themselves, all these communists, why? Why? And they asked them the, in Germany and Italy, especially, where revolutions fail in 1919, and they all come up with the same answer, whether it's Antonio Gramsci in Italy or Max Horkheimer and in, in, in the, the Frankfurt Schoolers in Germany, and that is they realize that the worker has, has uh, embraced uh, religion, has embraced God, has embraced the family, has embraced uh, capitalism, and has embraced the nation state. He's religious, likes his family, and is patriotic. And they, they, so, so they think that the worker has false consciousness. Uh, so, as you rightly put it, they, they, because of the Third Reich, they come here. Uh, Columbia uh, Teachers College offers them a place. Uh, a place to where they, from, where they can, uh, you know, gather uh, and, and work. And so people like Mark, Max Horkheimer, the director of the Institute, uh, they, they, we call it the Frankfurt School, but it's really called the, the Institute for Social Research. It was first we'll go, it was going to be called the Institute for Marxism. Then they realized that that was too, too upfront. Uh, they, yeah. they, 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 really, they really tried to hide their Marxism. But they're Marxists. If you read Horkheimer, and for my, for my sins I do, you realize that they, they I mean, they, they themselves say it. They, 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 they admired the Soviet Union. So they come to America and they, yeah, they hate America. They hate America even more than they hated the European worker. They think this place that offers them is salvation. But they, they, I mean, they're very curious and, uh, about America, but at the same time they say, well, the Americans are a bunch of boobs. You know, they, they go to their movies, they're happy. They have, uh, they have their, 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 their hi-fi sets and they have the split little homes. I'm quoting Horkheimer there. And the Horkheimer, before he dies, by the way, he gives it this interview in which he says, look, capitalism is better at producing material rewards. The material needs of the individual are better uh, taken care of by capitalism. And, and that's what makes capitalism so dangerous because it prevents revolution. And so that is really their work is to, to, to denigrate all the institutions, uh, the family, the capitalist system, which I think is irrational, uh, even the nation state in some ways. They want to get all these out of the way. It's a critical legal theory itself, I think, as you were alluding to, sort of a straight Marxist critique of the law and rooting it in, you know, power and wealth. And, and it's on behalf of that class, the capitalist class, that our, our laws uh, have been written and enforced. And critical race theory changes that in many respects and not changes it, but inserts race as sort of the explicit right. motivation. Yeah, right. And that's sort of what we're dealing with now is sort of race becomes the prism through which we understand all of American life and institutions. Trying to also get a grip on sort of the ideology behind BLM is to my mind, what they do with history in the sense of it's just a battle of narratives. And if you've heard, heard Nicole Hannah Jones say this about the founding we are contesting the dominant narrative with new facts. But the facts aren't really facts, they're interpretive methods to sort of change thinking. So history itself becomes very plastic. Yeah, no, I mean, they, they tried to undo, and I'm going to paraphrase Aristotle here. Aristotle had this great uh, maxim that says that, uh, you know, the only thing that's denied to the gods is to undo what has been done. Well, they tried to undo that. They tried to, to try to do what has been denied to the gods. They tried to say, no, these facts didn't happen, or these facts are going to be interpreted this other way. Another old maxim, he, he who controls the past controls the future. So they try to reinvent history uh, along their lines. Along, but when they do that, you mentioned Nicole Hannah Jones. They just plainly lie. Mm -hmm. So when Nicole Hannah Jones says, "Well, the revolution was fought because the colonists feared that the mother country, Britain, was going to take away the institution of slavery," that is a, just an outright lie. Mm -hmm. I mean, she gets that from 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 a, a, a court decision, the Somerset decision in London, in in the seventies. Uh, in which a, a, a slave who had been brought by a, a, an American planter to London is, is found not to be a slave. But that is, that's just a, a minuscule, that, that, that did not matter at all, did not, that's not the reason, it, it actually, it came after the, the 1760s when, when John Adams, 
called the revolution of the mind. By that time, the, 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 the wheels are, are, are going. So Nicole Hannah Jones, it's a complete uh, fabrication that this, that this is what motivated the revolution. And yet they say it. I mean, the, the New York Times had to actually retract that part because it was so embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, but you're quite right when you talk about critical legal theory. What the critical theorists did in the 60s is that they, they strongly influenced the new left Cap N, Cap L, uh, her, especially Herbert Marcuse. And, and out of that ferment uh, grew critical, critical legal theory. In fact, the godfather of critical legal theory, Duncan Kennedy, said in an essay, quote, I was very influenced from the beginning by the two strands of continental thought, the critical theory, the Western Marxist and post-Marxist strand, uh, which include Herbert Marcuse, etc. Uh, so so he, is, uh, he is a strongly uh, Duncan Kennedy and the other critical legal theorists influenced by critical theory, but they just apply it to the law. They say, yes, this is superstructure, which is a big thing for the critical theorists. It's, it's almost like the movie The Matrix. Uh, this is superstructure that is oppressive, but the critical legal theorists say it's, it's written into the law. You're quite right what the critical race theorists do. Their innovation is to say it's race, and race is the big thing in America, as we know. Uh, so they, they look at everything through that lens. Give us, I mean, something else, another term we hear a lot, structural racism, systemic racism. How are they defining those? So that is really the, the apex of critical race theory, as I said, they believe that racism is systemic, structural, is built, as Richard Delgado says, into the into the little things that we do in everyday life. And so it's the little things we do in everyday life that need to be uh, need to be replaced. Is the power struggle needs to overthrow uh, the way we just organize as a country. That is very similar to what the BLM founder Alicia Garza says that we need to uh, get rid of the organizing principle of society. So it's not just racist laws or racist uh, you know, events, uh, for, for which we have very strong laws already, by the way. We have, we have the Civil Rights Act, and if anything, is if, if an employer can be shown to have acted in a racist manner, to have made a racist decision, he or she can be prosecuted, and rightly so. We need to strongly prosecute people who are, have acted in, the, in a racist manner in, in the public sphere, where it is illegal to do so. So we do have very good laws already, thank God. We had, until 1964, we had legally imposed racism. You know, in the South, even if you wanted to, to, to sell a sandwich at a lunch counter to a black person, you couldn't because the law forced you to say, no, I can't. Uh, we changed that, and thank God for that, uh, and, and, and with the promise that we're going to have colorblind policy henceforth, the critical race theorists hate that part of the Civil Rights Act and Civil Rights Movement. They hate the promise of, of color blindness, and, and so does BLM. They want to have color-conscious policies. So this sort of, I mean, this is interesting too, as I sort of read some of the literature from critical race theory, it seems to me, with you know the Civil Rights Act, the way they're reading it is, it still sort of protects capitalism. And, and what it's saying is, you know, we have these competitive markets for jobs, uh, education, incomes, and sometimes there are these breakdowns. There are baddies. Uh, they discriminate on the basis of race, and we're going to help correct for that and make that difficult to do, and we're going to punish it if it happens. But it's still sort of preserving the structure. And I, and I, I take it, and this is like the intersectionality point, is sort of increasing the ways in which you know, wrongs can happen is it's sort of like, well, we're not really about that. We're about something else. Uh, we're about saying that, well, racism is actually so embedded that we need to really get inside the government and remake it and remake how it interacts with the economy, civil society, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, it, again, to quote Delgado, he says that, that, that racism happens in the ordinary business of society. Uh, right, uh, but in they, they they all, by the way, all critical race theorists and all the founders of Black Lives Matter hate capitalism. They they all say, and this is not just the founders of Black Lives Matter, but this includes uh, the, uh, the, the the retail practitioners of black of, uh, of critical race theory, Ibram X. Kendi, Robin D'Angelo. They're all on the record as saying that capitalism is racist and bad, and that is because they say they say that capitalism rewards. Uh, the, the wrong criteria. 
uh, that we have to change our criteria. Uh, it's not punctuality or hard work uh, that we need to reward. We need to reward other other areas of life, uh, which which they never really define. This is the old criticism of capitalism. For example, somebody who can hit a curveball uh, gets you know has a contract for four hundred million dollars, or somebody who's able to come up with a, a financial um, uh, an option, you know, to, to a new option or a put uh, can get it you know, can make millions and millions of dollars, whereas a teacher has a salary that's $50,000. They say that is unfair. That's the result of capitalism. Obviously, you're looking at a skill set. The, the people who can hit a curveball are very, very, very few. And as, as long as there are thousands and thousands and thousands of fans, including myself, are willing to go to a ballpark, that person who has the ability to hit a curveball is going to make a lot of money and should be rewarded. So, so, But they're at war with that, with that system. On this point, on you know, Black Lives Matter, in this sort of a way, I think of it sort of like it would be a socialist, a racialized socialist system, as I read this work, and and it's sort of the structural racism licenses tremendous power to get to that point. I wanted to just think for a minute about you've been you know, you've written this book, and you said you're, you're traveling a lot and dealing with critical race theory in the schools. Uh, Black Lives Matter this time last year looked ascendant, looked powerful, had a Democratic Party unwilling to criticize it, unwilling to link it to any of the violent protests that were happening, although I think the linkages are obvious. You talk about those in the book. Seems to me, though, that's not the case a year later in the same way. I mean, it does seem like a lot of Americans, including a lot of minorities, have sort of confronted this and don't like it, and sort of the progress has been halted. Uh, even though there's though there's still these ongoing attempts to do things. But it seems to me a lot of Americans have woken up, and that was sort of my worry last summer, was where is everybody? Well, there's two things here. One is we're very much living with the effects of Black Lives Matter in the summer of 2020. Uh, we have what are called the twin legacies of, of 2020 and Black Lives Matter. One is uh, the critical race theory, which has now invaded all aspects of our lives. That is a direct result of the summer of 2020 and Black Lives Matter. The reason why, uh, you know, your daughter just her, her Spanish, AP Spanish class, just spent a whole semester studying systems of oppression in Guatemala rather than Cervantes. Uh, that is a direct result of Black Lives Matter. The reason why many people listening to us right now will be dragged by HR into a quote-unquote anti-racism training program in their places of work, which are quite racist that break the law themselves. That is a result of Black Lives Matter. So that's one legacy. The other one is a huge spike in crime and homicides that we're seeing in our cities. That would put some, you know, anywhere between 25% and 35% uh, in, in, the, in 50 to 75 largest cities in America, where a lot of the Americans live, especially impoverished Americans. That is also the result of Black Lives Matter, and studies substantiate that. So, so we're living, the, the America that we live in today is, has, has made, made worse and inferior because of Black Lives Matter. Now, what you said is exactly right. A lot of Americans are saying, no, no, we don't like this. That's the reason why you see these divisive conflicts arising from coast to coast, because Americans who are quite attached to liberty, uniquely, exceptionally attached to liberty, say, no, we don't want our lives torn up this way, and we don't want the system thrown out this way, and we don't want America, the foundations of America, to pull out, be pulled out from under us. Uh, and, and so opinion polls have shown that support for Black Lives Matter has steadily declined. But that is because a lot of people like like me, a lot of people, you know, not, not just me, you know, a lot of people have been writing this, but not the press. No. Now, the journalists are uh, not writing this. So I have... Two, two people whom I blame for the fact that many Americans still do not know the truth about Black Lives Matter. One is the, the, the media, the mainstream media. They did not cover Black Lives Matter. And the other one is the political class. The Republican Party has not been great in this. If some, yeah, they'll pound the table about Antifa, and that's because Antifa is is apparently it's, it, yeah, we don't know Antifa as well, but it, it looks like it's a lot more white than Black Lives Matter. Antifa doesn't have Black Lives Matter in its title, but Antifa doesn't have anywhere near the power that Black Lives Matter does. 
Black Lives Matter has a curriculum now that is being taught in the majority of this of, of the country's 14,000 school districts. Black Lives Matter has a bill in Congress. Black Lives Matter is partnering with the, with the musical Hamilton. Um, so even though we hear less about it and there's less support, we're living in a Black Lives Matter world. It's interesting, too. I, I don't know it would be a majority of school districts. That's interesting. One of the things that's worked in their favor, I think, in, in, in the sense of the systemic racism point, is there are pretty stark differences between whites and blacks on you know, wealth differences, income differences, health differences, uh, private property ownership, home ownership, things like that. And you know, we can debate the consequence or the causes of that. You and I probably have you know a, a different. You and I probably agree on the causes, but that's not what most people are in, in official positions of power are willing to accept. And that seems to give rise to saying, oh, yeah, this is systemic racism. So I guess one question is, how do you deal with that point? I mean, we can talk about causes. We can try to make the arguments, but you, you, it's, it's difficult to break through in that regard. You know, and something else is sort of this point about crime that, that BLM has always been associated with, has, has latched onto the violent crime, mass incarceration, and sort of these differences in, in incarceration rates between blacks and primarily black men and white men. How should one think about that? Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons I wrote my book, and it's all in my book. I, I, I want to expose all of this. Look, we need to, if we want to solve all these problems, we need to talk about them. We need to talk about the causes of the disparities. Uh, first of all, we need to say, we need to disaggregate Black. We need to disaggregate the, 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 the data in whites. We need to look at, for example, if you disaggregate from country of origin, you realize that Nigerian Americans and Ghanaian Americans have a much higher income per household than white Americans. A professor at Columbia University, Van Tran, who does a who does the very interesting studies looking at the second generation West Indians in New York. Why second generation? Because they're the children of immigrants. The immigrant is the first generation. So they, they don't have an accent. They have what he calls, what Van Tran calls, uh, zero visibility as an immigrant and 100% visibility as blacks. So in other words, they're going to encounter racism. If there's a racist store owner and they walk into the store, they're going to, the, the, the store owner is going to be, you know, chasing them around. If there's a racist policeman, the policeman is going to, to be harder on them because they're black. However, the second generation West Indians that have been looked at by this professor at Columbia in New York have closed the gap across eight measures with whites, and not completely, but a great deal. And why is that? He's looked at the family structure. Not only is the family in, intact, but the parents are very strict. They live in the same neighborhoods in New York. They live in the same inner city neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And yet they, they force their, 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 their children to come in. When, they say, when the lights go on, go on, the children come in. They succumb less to peer pressure. Mm -hmm. There's a number of reasons why they do better in the, in the cultural indicators. And then you have to also to look at black Americans, native black Americans, with intact families. Again, the measurements improve vastly. So you have to disaggregate, and you have to look at that and white Americans, and look at uh, white Americans with intact families and white Americans with uh, you know no family. The father's not there. All, all the, 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 the you know dysfunctions that we know about, they don't do very well. Family dysfunction and the destruction of family is an equal opportunity killer. Yeah, is color blind. So it depends on how we look at the data. Uh, and how we look at the, at, the, at the cultural indicators, and then we'll have a much better picture. But in, in terms of mass incarceration, as I mentioned in my book, in 2019, the percentage of black Americans who were being put in prison had been declining at a much faster rate than that of whites. So that was improving just as we entered the year of, of 2020 after the, the harrowing death of George Floyd and the, the deft use of that video by the Black Lives Matter organizations. It, it seems to me you have a, sort of an interesting history in the book, uh, which I was not aware of, of you know, Soviet Union forms, and pretty quickly they, you know, they're thinking about ways they can infiltrate countries. This is a missionary communism being a missionary ideology. And 
one way they they think they can penetrate America is through this, uh, you know, the injustices uh, that Black Ameri- Americans had experienced, and they start reaching out to intellectuals first to try and find ways to build inroads. And as I read your book, I, I took you to be making the point. You know, this is sort of just a common problem in in America, the the racism that we've had, and it becomes a source of. Uh, it's, it's very, been very difficult to deal with, and, but it becomes a way, a way, a point of infiltration. And it's it's been there, it predates Black Lives Matter, as you point in the book. You go back to the 70s and the 60s. You have an interesting chapter, then the 60s happened in terms of a change in thinking uh, amongst intellectuals about how to use race or what racism should mean in the law. So this is sort of ongoing, but the point being, I think, is your point being, uh, it's not about the racism. Racism is the entry point to sort of increase or demonstrably increase socialism in American life and thinking. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Richard. Actually, take it back to the 20s, right after the Soviet Union is, is, is created, and they, they really see huge potential. They actually want to divide America into black America and white America, and they invite black intellectuals. Let's not forget that at the same time, you have the Harlem Renaissance, which is incredible outpouring of, of writing, of music, of uh, you know a population that had been enslaved uh, just a few decades earlier, shows what it can do once it's free. All these great, Langston Hughes is a good writer, and yet they, get, they become enamored of the Soviet Union. He goes to the Soviet Union. W.B. Du Bois, a very insightful black writer, also becomes in love with the Soviet Union. In fact, he applies to join the party right before he dies in, in the 60s. Uh, he goes to see Mao and everything else. However, rank and file black Americans have no truck with this. They don't want it. All they're asking for is for their white compatriots to accept them into American life. They want to be accepted. They don't, they don't like communism. They understand that communism is going to destroy their families, is going to destroy uh, uh, their livelihoods. So there's a rejection. And in fact, the Soviet Union in the 50s ends up giving up. It realizes that black America has been a, a complete failure, and it gives up this idea of dividing America. It has, it has won only intellectuals, just like it does with white Americans, by the way. Uh, it won only intellectuals. Rank and file families, whether they're black or white, of Americans say no thank you to the Soviet Union uh, in the 1960s following the culture, the following uh, uh, the Cuban Revolution uh, and, and the Cultural Revolution in China. A lot of American students do become radicalized, but also they're radicalized by, by the fact that, you know, the critical theorists are here. Marcuse, the, the, the guru of the new left, and you then you do have the Black Panthers, you have uh, the Weathermen, you have Students for Democratic Society, you have all these radical groups running around the, the, the Black Liberation Army uh, that, that are quite Malcolm X, uh, that are quite Marxist and quite revolutionary in their outlook. Stokely Carmichael goes to Havana uh, and so forth. And that is really the people from that era go on to influence Black Lives Matter. Let's not forget that the intellectual mentor of the Black Lives Matter organization's founders is none other than, than Angela Davis. Angela Davis is the grand old dame of American communism. She runs on the Communist Party ticket as vice president twice. She, she still goes to colleges and universities. She's still around, and she's very active. She goes to colleges and universities and says, I'm a communist, and I've always been a communist. And these poor college students from Santa Barbara to UVA stand up and give her a rousing standing ovation because they don't know any better. Uh, and, and she was a student of Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse at Brandeis. She, you know, so there's a direct link between the critical theorists and Black Lives Matter through Angela Davis, uh, which is, I, I point out in my book, BLM, The Making of a New Marxist Revolution. You talk about the 60s happened. You have a chapter uh, called that. What, what do you mean? What, what, how did that change well, as I said, I think that the first of all, is there's Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Uh, second of all, blacks have had it with segregation in the South, and they quite rightly, you know, uh, yeah. demonstrating and marching. And all of a sudden, these you know these suburban white kids in the North are seeing on TV what is taking place, 
and they rightly don't want to ignore it anymore. And then, then the, the, the Vietnam War, which is kind of leaderless, and uh, Johnson just gets us further into it without any really any plan for success, and and that provides a spark for I think a lot of radicals to come in and create, try to to revolutionize America. They, they, the leaders of the Weathermen uh, look at look at Che and look at Fidel Castro, and they say these are white law students or white medical students who are able to revolutionize an entire society, we can do the same thing here. Of course they can't, and they, they, they prove to be the keystone cops of terrorism. But but they, as I said, they, I think their they, they main influence, because they, they failed to revolutionize America. America does come through, but now the people they have intellectually influenced are changing us more deeply than they ever dreamed in the 60s. Thinking about this moment that we're in, what do you make of the success of Black Lives Matter in the suburbs? I know we've been talking about it. You've been describing it with a Marxist analysis as having built on a Marxist analysis. I don't dispute that. But what do you think is going on in, say, wealthy suburbs? I think about the one I live in where we had Black Lives Matter protests, which were just basically white kids. What do you think is going on there? What is this, is this a feeling the religious-like characteristics? Of this movement filling a need in their lives, a void in their lives, or, or what's going on? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I, I do discuss in my chapter on the 60s the manipulation of white guilt. Uh, and I think that a lot of people, you know, looked at the, 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 the harrowing death of George Floyd, those, those, those awful nine minutes captured on film, or video rather, and they they were you know nobody nobody looked at that and and came away not disgusted by it and and I think the message that what they want that what black black lives matter wants is social justice has uh has resonated because it it has been filtered it will, by the press the press will not mention any of the things I mentioned in my book, they will not mention that the uh that the black lives matter leaders are, are Marxists. they never mention that they want to completely changed the American system, American society. The press just says that what they want to do is discuss uh, history for the first time, uh, that what people like me, uh, what we, don't, we don't want history to be discussed. That is a, that's a complete canard, by the way. And not only do I want more history to be taught, I want Frederick Douglass, I want even W.B. Du Bois, even though I disagree with him, I, I want him taught. I want American students to learn more about this, not less. And, and I tell you that I'm in close contact with everyone in my space, uh, and, and nobody, I don't know anybody who says no history should not be taught, uh, whether it's the history of slavery or segregation or Jim Crow. So I think that the people in the suburbs, good Americans, who pitch, my neighbors, who pitch Black Lives Matter signs on their lawns, uh, in many ways, they're completely unaware of what is taking place. They're completely unaware of who, who the they are, the Black Lives Matter leaders, they lead busy lives. Uh, they don't want their lifestyle to be upended. They don't want their lifestyle to, if they did, they would just, you know, sell their, their big houses in the suburbs and share the money with with the, the poor. Mm -hmm. So so that's not what they want. They don't want their lives to change. They just want social justice. What they're embracing, though, when they embrace Black Lives Matter as the organizations, uh, is something that will have a very nefarious consequences on everybody. Now, there are people who, I don't know how, make the case and say, well, you have to differentiate the the leaders and the organizations from the movement. The movement is a, is an, a, a, a formless word. What yeah. matters is the organizations. They have millions and millions and millions of dollars. They have a bill in Congress. They're making real change in America. The, the Soviet Union had a great term for people who, who just went along and, and refused to believe that the Soviet Union was evil. They, they called them useful idiots. Uh, that's, that's a harsh term to use for people who are well-intentioned but misinformed today regarding Black Lives Matter. Uh, but there is a, a certain link there to, to, the, way, to, to the old Soviet term. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, one of the ways, something that uh, we've already, we're seeing now, federal courts turn back this attempt. I mean, and I think this is directly related to, to, to BLM. Uh, the Biden administration, through the Agricultural Department, making loans available to farmers uh, who are minorities but not to white farmers, who who may be even you know even more financially 
a disadvantage. Who, who knows? And, and the courts are simply saying, well, you can't do that. We have laws here about discrimination, what it entails, how to prove it. And you're, you're you know, offering this loan to someone just on the basis of skin color without even proving the discrimination or, or any of the ways we tried to ev- have evidence for that. So there's, I mean, there, there, that's just one sign of, uh, it's quite striking to me to, to think about. And a lot of state governments uh, have done similar things. So we, you know, we really are dividing ourselves up by race at, at that point. If that were to this continue. is a ginormous step yeah. backward. This is something that is very serious, and, and we must really uh, be very aware of. And it's also a direct result of Black Lives Matter, because um, this is this is the first time since the end of Jim Crow uh, that we have the U.S. government not affording Americans equal protection under the law because of their race. We decided as a country that we were going to stop doing that. We decided as a country that the Plessy era did not work, that separate but equal did not work, that that discriminating on the basis of race did not work. And to go back to that, which is exactly what CRT and BLM wants, it would be, in fact, I think most Americans would say, no, you're quite right. A judge in Florida said that the the, the Raphael Warnock um, amendment that President Biden so unwisely signed into law was unconstitutional, and and you cannot make these decisions based on on pigmentation. And thank God for that. And I hope that every time this is tried again, a judge will step in and say, this is a little matter of the Constitution. You can't do that. So it seems to me it's interesting, sort of parts of the ideology trying to find, uh, you know, legal application. So it seems to me like defund the police uh, has already proven to be a failure, as we knew it would. It seems to be in all but the bluest of jurisdictions that's sort of being turned back. And, and even those leaders in those cities, uh, while they might say defund the police, they're also trying to recruit more police, the, the articles that I've read. But something like this, like making loans available, you can sell that as, well, we're just we're trying to help people who are the victims of past discrimination, something like that. And that might actually work. So it seems to me there's different parts of the agenda that might have greater or lesser amounts of success. Well, it didn't work. You can, because, yeah. we, because we can say, uh, look, show us, if you can show how somebody was discriminated against and, and, and he incurred a loss because of the discrimination, we can make him whole. Yeah. But you have to have, you know, evidentiary rules. We have to be able to prove that this happened, in which case somebody broke the law and we're going to make a right. That is different from a blanket, yeah. uh, you know, we're going to give Oprah Winfrey, uh, a, you know, this benefit, and we're going to give um, uh, Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio this benefit that we're going to deny some poor, um, uh, you know, sharecropper in Alabama because, you know, his ancestry came from Northern Ireland. It, it, that, that just doesn't sell. Uh, with regards to the defund the police, you know, I visit the Black Lives Matter uh, site fairly often. They, they're putting up all sorts of uh, uh, videos uh, on how successful they're being in stopping the building, not just of prisons, but the building of prison hospitals in prison psychiatric wards. What are the things they're doing? I mean, they're very, very proud of this. Uh, so so they, they're proud of the fact that they're stopping the building of hospitals? Where are sick prisoners going to go? What they want, and Patrice Collars is very open about this in a video she made just a few months ago, is they want to not just defund the police, they want to defund the, uh, they want to end the prison system, and they want to end the court system. And no society can live like that. And and we also have the rogue prosecutors in American cities, in San Francisco, in Boston, in L.A., uh, in many different places, even nearby in Virginia, which... The police are making fewer arrests because they're pulling back. Surprise, surprise, because there's a criticism they've come under. But when they do make arrests, the prosecutors are putting these people back onto the street. Uh, they're not prosecuting. They're not, they're, not, they're not charging them with anything. Do you want to know why we have a 25 to 35% increase in the homicide rate? I think this is a pretty good reason why. Yeah. So I, I, I think even though politically to say defund the police, uh, but, and by the way, Cory Bush, just made a video two weeks ago, you know, this, this congresswoman who's, who's a, a BLM supporter saying, no, I want to defund the police. We need to get rid of the police. 
So, so I, I think we're living, even though we may not know it, we're living in a BLM world. That's interesting. So, as you have traveled and, and thought about the, these issues a lot, what do you think is key to getting beyond this moment? I think exposure. I think exposure, which is the reason I wrote my book, uh, BLM, The Making of a New Marxist Revolution, I think is to, to, to prove to people, I think that's already succeeded, as you put it yourself earlier, support. The polls show that, yes, especially among white Americans and those Americans who designate themselves as Hispanic, support for BLM has dropped uh, substantially. I think that we need to, to continue to do this work. I think we continue. We need to have a real reckoning in America, and not the, the false faux reckoning, racial reckoning that the journalists, that the, that the media class uh, tried to pretend that we had last year. We need to have a real reckoning over who we are as a country. What do our would-be leaders, people who want to lead us, what do they think? Do they think we're evil? Do they think that we're systemically racist? Do they think we need to overturn the system? Uh, we need to put them on the spot and then uh, make make them accountable. Okay. So I think that that is a, the way. At first, we need to have a revolution of the mind, such as like, like the colonists had in the 1760s when Britain had intolerable acts. And then we need to, to, to act on that revolution of the mind. And once we change minds, the politicians, even the bad politicians, will do the right thing. Uh, that's a Milton Friedman quote. Uh, it's not, we can't expect just the good politicians. We need to, to create such an environment in which the bad politicians will do the right thing. All right. Mike Gonzalez, we've been talking with the author of BLM. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. This is Richard Reinch. You've been listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk. Available at lawliberty.org.